observed over the last few months and really over most of my life, but it seems like the, there's been a lot on the table the last few months that, that for a lot of people, life isn't going according to plan. Anybody? Anybody feel like, hey, my life is not going the way that I thought it was going to go? A few of you. And I'm not going to betray any, conse- any um, confidences in, in what I say. So if you're someone who's going through some of these, these are just some things that I'm seeing in, uh, kind of across the board. Uh, believe me, I, I am, this is like, I'm not talking about, you know, I'd be talking about you, but I'm not talking about you, all right? That health for many people isn't going according to way, the plan, right? You, that because of this sickness or this disease or this injury or this chronic problem, life is being handicapped and you're not able to do the things you want to do and, and go about the business and, and live your life the way you want to live it. A lot of people are dealing with pretty dramatic health issues. Relationships aren't going to plan. People's marriages are not where they wish they were, not where they thought that they were going to be, not going the way that they, that, that they hoped that they would. And, and people are struggling in those relationships. And it seems like a lot of things, you know, going into the three years, the two years of the pandemic, um, just kind of created this crucible that has brought out some of the hardest things. And, and, and healing has been difficult and, and challenging. And there's been struggles with that. Families, for many people, aren't going the way that they, that they thought that they were going to go. They, that for many parents, their, their kids are struggling. And, and, um, and the parents want to help and don't know how to help and wish that they could do things that they can't do. And, and in, in other relationships, things aren't going the way, ways that people hope. Careers aren't going the way that people hope that their careers would go. And you come to a place and you think, you know, I just, I ought to be farther along or I shouldn't be having to go back to this point or I feel like I'm going to have to start all over again because I was gone this path and now I'm here. Finances aren't going the way people hoped that they would go. And like I'm in a kind of a category where a lot of the people in, in my age group are, are getting closer and closer to retirement age. And, and it's like, and I thought that I would be in a better place. And I thought I would be, you know, like, and, and it's not stacking up right. The numbers aren't adding up right. For a lot of people, life isn't going the way that they thought that it would go in, in a lot of different areas. And when we struggle, when we go through difficulties and things aren't matching up to our expectations, to our hopes and our dreams, it begs the question, why? You know, why isn't it going better? Why isn't this developing or expanding or, or growing or the, the way that I hoped and dreamed and planned and, the, and even the way that I worked for it, did I blow it? Did I mess it up? Am I doing something wrong? It, it, oftentimes, as we look around, it's like it's because of this person or that person, and they're not meeting up to my expectations and, and, and what I hoped and dreamed for them. And, and so we, we blame people for, for the, the, the ways that it's not working out. Why? And if you're a person of faith, then, then God enters the, the equation too, right? But why God? God, why aren't you taking care of this? Why aren't you fixing this? Why aren't you making it better? What does it mean for me to rely upon you, to depend upon you, to trust you, and I'm trying to do these things, and I'm trying to walk with you, and I'm trying to live this kind of life, and, and still, even though I'm doing my very best, it's not matching up. It's not measuring up. One of the, you know, there are some sermons uh, that... I've heard in the course of my life that they're, they're just unforgettable. Like they're, they're, usually it's a phrase or something you hear. There's a sermon I heard early um, in, like, I mean, probably like 30 years ago, no, almost 40 years ago. And um, the preacher was talking about how his life wasn't matching up, and, and he had a, a serious back injury. And he went through this, and he was like flat on his back for, for months. And, and during his... his um, experience of, of being in excruciating pain and, and out of service and not being able to, to, to lead the church, not being able to, to lead his family, not able to do the things that he wanted to do. And he came out of that experience and he stood up one Sunday and he talked about his suffering. He says, when we go through suffering, there's three questions we ask. And especially when we're people of faith, and it's like, God, 
Why me? Why is this happening to me? Like in a world of six or seven billion people, why am I having to go through this suffering? Why me? And why this? Like the suffering that we experience, it almost never comes where we think it's going to come from. It comes from another angle. Our worst fears. Why? Why me? Why this? And why, why now? Why at this juncture, right? Like just when we're about to get here, or just when this is about to happen, or just when I think we're going there, it's going to go this. Why, why is this happening to me now? God, why aren't you intervening? God, why aren't you rescuing? God, why aren't you saving? God, why aren't you coming through? I'm going to delve into another psalm this morning. I call the this, this psalms faith in the trenches. It's, it's faith where we live life as it is, not as we wish it was or not as we think it should be. Faith in the hardships, faith in the struggles, faith in the difficulties. And we're going to look at Psalm 131 this morning. Psalm 131 is a psalm that was written by David, king of Israel, the, um, attributed um, to being uh, one of the most prolific songwriters maybe in the history of, of the kingdom of heaven. And he writes this in Psalm 131. He says, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child. I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. David says to all of those who are struggling with the hardships and the difficulties and the frustrations and, and life's not going the way that they think it should be going and who are not content, David says, hey guys, I am content. I am at peace. Which I think is really interesting. If you read kind of the, the whole of David's collection of, of works, he's credited with writing 73 of the 150 Psalms. And David spent plenty of time in many of his other 73 psalms espousing his discontent. Right? He, he, he does a lot of whining and complaining and sniveling and grumbling along his way. Maybe like a lot of you and me. I'll just give you a handful of examples. Psalm chapter 6. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? Does that sound like a profession of contentment? God, my body is breaking. How long? Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? How long, Lord, will my brains, my thoughts, my mental struggles continue? How long will I be heartbroken? Contentment? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cry of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Psalm 38, all my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from me. My heart pounds. My strength fails. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. I'm alone in my suffering. Forgotten. Psalm 73. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth, 
Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence all day long. I have been afflicted, and every morning breeds me new punishments. God, the bad people are winning, and the good people are suffering. Why, God? Where are you? What's going on? So the question I want to ask, how does David get from this place of discontent about his mental thoughts and his, and his anxiousness and his struggles and his woes and his loneliness and his sickness, how does he get from this place of discontent to this place in Psalm 131 where he says, I am content? What is his journey? In Psalm 131, he says, My heart is not proud. My heart is not proud. I have humbled myself. Pride is exalting the self. Pride is lifting the self up. Pride is saying, I am the ruler of my destiny. I am in control. And the world needs to recognize my place in it, acknowledge it, and give me my due. Because if I'm the center of the universe, y'all ought to be bowing down to me. My whims ought to win. Family, wife, church members, don't you see? I have humbled myself. Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms. Uh, In it, David um, goes through this whole profession of God's presence in his life. And he comes to the end of it, and he's saying, God, you are with me. You see me. You know everything about me. You know when I rise. You know when I lie down. You know when I'm from afar. You know when I go down to the depths. God, you know everything about me. You know every, wherever I am all along the way. And celebrating that, in a sense, it almost sounds like David is the center of God's universe. He comes to this place in verse 19. And he says, if only, God, you would slay the wicked. I have nothing but hatred for them. God, you get it. You get that I'm the center of the universe. If only you would straighten everybody else out so that they see it, so that they understand it, so that they would acknowledge it, so that they would humble themselves before me. And apparently in in the process of praying this, David has an awakening. And then he comes to verse 23. It says, oh, hold on a second. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the right path. Search me, O God. Know my thoughts. Test me. You have anxiousness? Anxiousness is the product of being the ruler of our ma- the master of our universe. He says, anywhere that I'm trying to control things, there's going to be anxious. God, show me where those things are. I'm humbling myself now before you. My heart is not proud. The first step, I have humbled myself before you. And David's path to contentment. My eyes are not haughty. I have embraced my limitations. I'm not looking at my rule and reign over all of things and saying I'm the Lord of the universe. I'll give you this little tidbit from my backpacking trip this last week. I took a lot of baggage on the trail this year. Baggage in the sense of um, just a lot of, of... people that I know and love and care about who are dealing with physical issues, dealing with 
relational issues, dealing with mental health issues, struggles. And, and there was almost a sense there's just so many things, so many people that, that are hurting and, and in difficult places. And is this even the right time for me to, to exit civilization? Because when you go on a trail, right, it's like we go places where you do not have internet access. Right? When we leave the, the trailhead, we cannot be reached, and I cannot reach you. Occasionally, like on a mountaintop, we might pick up a signal. But the people who are struggling, the people who are going through this stuff, they can't get a hold of me. They won't be able to contact me. Do I need to, like, not do this now? Baggage. It wasn't in my backpack, right? It was on my heart and my spirit. And um, like some of you, I have for the past several months, every day, done um, this prayer process. It's, it's um, in the, the pause app if you use that. And, and the beginning of the, the first part of the pause is, Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. It, it's a surrendering. It's, it's a letting go. And on the trail, second day, I think, um, I'm, we always say a prayer before we hit the trail on a given day. And, and I just, I pray this prayer, Lord, I give everyone and everything to you. And it struck me in a way that it, like, because I'm here, because I'm out of contact, because I'm in the middle of the wilderness, this realization that truly there is nothing else I can do for anyone anywhere in the world, then just give them to God right here, right now. And that realization, that recognition, was a different kind of surrender than when I'm here and when I still think, okay, I'm giving it to you, God, but I still know that I'm close enough to the strings that I can pull them here and maybe make something happen, maybe fix this, maybe take care of that, maybe... Save this wound. Not there. Embracing our limitations. Recognizing that in our humanity that there are some things that we simply cannot do. Cannot manipulate. Cannot twist or turn to the right end. I embraced my limitation. My eyes are not haughty. David continues, I have calmed and quieted myself. I've settled myself down. Jesus made a habit in his ministry regularly of going out early in the morning alone to pray to be alone with his father. All the chaos, all the expectations, all the crowds, all the demands pressing upon him, these disciples that, that he's training, equipping to lead the mission after his death, resurrection, and ascension. And they were, they were slow learners. They did not make his task easy. All of this going on, and on a regular basis, he went off to the mountains. He shut out the noise. He stopped. Quieted himself. Humbled himself in the presence of his father. To get to this place of contentment, David had to calm and quiet his spirit. If you tr if you've tried that, you know, understand that the saints called this the practice of spiritual disciplines. Dis like discipline, not like you're naughty, you need to be punished. Discipline like you want to be at a different place in your life. You want to be more content. You want to have more peace. 
Like if you want to run a marathon, you have to discipline yourself by, by training, by getting up every morning or every, going out and doing the runs. If you want to win the Women's World Cup, you have to, sorry, too soon? If you want to be a part of a team that's successful, you have to dis- you have a coach, and they train you, and they equip you. They teach you. And you work together, and you practice. Spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. And this is what I hate about disciplines. Intending to do it, wanting to do it, planning to do it, does not give you the result of having done it. Only doing it gives you the result of having done it. I've quieted myself. I have calmed myself. I have settled myself down. Or I'll give you this one tidbit from the concert. You need to calm down. And David's contentment isn't the result of resignation or diminished expectations. He's not looking at this and saying, like, okay, my life's not going the way that I thought it was going to go. I'm not as healthy. People are not being as nice to me. I'm not being as successful as I wanted to be. So I'm just going to lower the bar. I'm just not going to expect it. It's not, he's not like... Um, did you know that like, the Finnish people, year after year after year, are the happiest country in the world? The, the Finnish people have this statement, or this proverb that they say. Um, happiness is a, pl- a place between too little and too much. They're the happiest people in the world, and their proverb is, happiness is a place between too little and and too much. Which some people interpret to say, the reason the Finnish people are so happy is they just don't expect too much. So they're never disappointed. But David has not dropped the bar. He commends hope in the Lord now and forever. Hope in the Lord now and forever. Hope is a manifestation of desire. Paul says it this way. No one hopes for what they already have. If you have it, you don't need to hope for it. So if you hope for something, you are looking for something, wanting something, desiring something that you do not have. David's contentment is not the absence of desire or expectation. What is this hope that he's commending us to? that God will finally check all the boxes on our list of hopes and expectations and dreams, that God will finally say, okay, uh, okay, health, yep, check, fix that problem, took care of that, no more knee problems, no more back problems, no more mental health issues, got that taken care of. Is David's hope that that God will say, okay, now check the relationship box, that's all good now, check the the savings box so you can retire, check that one, check the the career box, check the, the kids box, they're all okay now, that God will check. Is his hope in the Lord that God will finally get it together and fix all of his problems? David does not say, hope in the Lord finally coming through for me. He simply says, hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord himself. Hope not what in God can do or what God may do or may not do. Hope in who God is, in his character in his nature, in his very essence. Hebrews chapter 11 is an account of the heroes of the faith. And in the end of the chapter, it makes this statement. It says the ancients, talking about these heroes of the faith, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Rahab, and on and on it goes. It says we're all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what God promised. They were commended for their faith, yet God didn't check any of the boxes for them. It 
God had planned something better than the boxes. They were putting their hope not in their checklist. Their hope was in the God who had promised and him alone. James says, humble yourself before the Lord. Humble your checklist before the Lord. Humble your expectations before the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord and in the Lord alone. And he says, and he will lift you up. The context for this transformation that David goes through is worship. If you look at the, um, in your Bible, um, at the, the heading for Psalm 131, it says, um, so a song of a sense. A song of a sense. There's actually a series of psalms that Psalm 131 is a, pro, a part of. The song, uh, so, the song of a sense were the songs, it was like the playlist for Israel when they would go up to Jerusalem for their annual festivals. They had three of them, three times a year. They would, they would travel to Jerusalem for their festivals and they, they, they would sing these songs along the way. It was worship. It was preparing them for their encounter with God. It re- these songs rehearsed their story, reminding themselves of who God was to them and who they were to God. David puts this transformation from our brokenness and our pain and our hardship and our struggling to contentment in the context of worship because worship brings us into the presence of God. And it's there that we discover who is on the throne and are reminded of who is not on the throne. And in that revelation are led to a posture and a place of humility. David captures it in a single word. Lord. Lord. Master. Because to address someone as master is to say, I am not. Lord. David's metaphor for this transformation is a weaned child. This contentment that I have. He says, I am like a weaned child with its mother. A weaned, an unweaned child is, goes to his mother to get something, to be fed, right? That's why an unweaned child is at his mother's breast to, to be nourished, to be fed. David is contrasting that. An unweaned child or a weaned child is with its mother, but not demanding something, not needing something, not wanting something, just to be with her, in her company, in her presence, in her safety, in her security. His picture of how he is relating, how he is trusting, how he is resting with God, is I'm not here pining, I'm not here whining, I'm not here complaining, I am here simply being with, resting with God. Now, an unweaned child that is four months old is a beautiful thing, isn't it? A mother, an infant at its mother's breast being nourished, and it's a beautiful picture. Mother providing for a child and a child relying upon her mother for a four-month-old. A four- year old unweaned child mm, right? in some cultures it's practiced but not many four year olds in our culture are still breastfeeding but a 14 year old child <laughs> right downright creepy
a, a maturation, a growing up in this relationship with our Creator. Here's the thing, though. Weaning is a disruptive process. Denying something to a child who has come to expect it does not always go smoothly. And for my part, I am blown away by how willing God is to allow his children to go through that process. To stand back and watch us through the weaning process. And sometimes I wish you would like let up, right? God, just, you know, give me just a little drink here. I know I'm 14 or 40 or maybe even more, but yeah. But weaning, as disruptive as it is, opens the door to a wealth of new experiences. Literally, right? You go from unweaned to weaned. You go from having one supply of nutrition to carrots and peaches and ice cream and filet and all, you know, like this whole world is opened up to you because you went from, we went from being unweaned to weaned. This is David's metaphor. This is what it's like for me now. I have this whole world being up to, because I am now with God, but not whining, not needing, not complaining, just in his presence. Weaning paves a way for a richer, fuller relationship between the mother and the child. A whole different kind of encounter. Preachers, we love to like use metaphors to show what things look like and are tempted sometimes when we've actually been given the metaphor to make a new metaphor for the metaphor. David said, here it is. Here's your metaphor. The kind of relationship that leads to contentment and the kind of relationship that God desires to have with you is this picture of a weaned child with its mother. And my question is this. Are you? Are you? Can you say with David, I am content? Not that all of my expectations have been fulfilled, not that everything in my life, but that I am, in spite of all that, because I am, my hope is in the Lord, because I am with him, I am content. The process humbling ourselves, of recognizing and embracing our limitations, of calming ourselves, settling ourselves, pulling away despite all of the demands and expectations, saying, no, I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop. I'm going to invite you this morning as we close our worship to surrender. And we're going to do it this way, okay? I'm going to, our worship team, I'm going to pray, close our, um, the message here. Our worship team's going to come up, and we're going to re-sing a song that we, that we sang in our opening worship set, the Highland song. It is a, as you will see in the song, a song of ascents. It's about coming into the presence of God. And it is a song of release. So I just, as you sing, if it is your... If you've got some baggage that you're carrying this morning and you need not more fixing, but you know you need more of God in your journey, to simply open your hands and surrender, to let it go as we sing this song. Lord, there is a boatload of struggles and challenges in the world that we live in. And we walked in the door this morning. I walk in the door every morning thinking, I wish that you would show up and fix this and take care of that and make this better for me and for the people that I love and for the community that we live in. 
I want more of your blessings, more of your gifts, more of your good stuff, more of your power, more of your transformation. And what we find in David through his struggle is this coming to a place of saying, what I need more than all that stuff is more of you. And so as we close our time this morning, Lord, meet us where each person is, where we sit, where we come, where we're struggling, where we're doubting, where we're frustrated, where we're disappointed, where we're longing. And we surrender to you. We pray in Jesus' name.